Okay, today we have, uh, it's a pleasure for me to be able to uh, introduce Steve Garman. Uh, Steve is, a, is an assistant uh, professor at Oregon State University for Science Department. And uh, Steve um, has been working in uh, landscape ecology for, uh, for a greater percentage of his career than most people. Uh, he is trained uh, as a wildlife biologist, uh, but fairly early on, um, he uh, began looking at uh, uh, trying to understand wildlife from a, from a much bigger perspective. Uh, he is uh, doing a lot of different kinds of research, mostly on the west side, but he has uh, been involved with some of these side issues. And uh, he tends to be associated with uh, uh, looking at uh, uh, vegetation dynamics and vertebrate habitat uh, associations. And I suppose in a nutshell, you could say that what he likes to do is he, he likes to use remote sensing and GIS uh, to, to look at disturbance agents. And so we thought it'd be a, a pretty appropriate to have him uh, come over here and, uh, and speak to us about uh, uh, patterns uh, and the processes that create them, especially considering the fact that all of us now in the PNW station are within that uh, disturbance program. So we all have to be doing work on disturbance and understanding it. Okay, I wanted to also mention that I have three uh, papers that uh, are written, uh, co-opted by Steve uh, here. And if anybody wants these, there's, um, uh, there's one on detecting fine-scale disturbance in forested ecosystems as measured by large-scale landscape patterns. And there's one on alternative silvicultural practices and diversity of animal habitat in Western Oregon. And another on alternative silviculture regimes uh, that he co-authored with Andy Hansen. So three papers here, and if you'd like those, just let me know, and I can make copies uh, right away, and we can get them to you. Okay, with no uh, further ado, uh, I'll introduce Steve. Uh, the title of this talk today is uh, Landscape Analysis and Ecosystem Management, Modeling Process and Pattern. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Well, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I don't get over this way much, so it's, it's sort of nice just to be here and check it out in general. Uh, as Jim mentioned, um, we're talking about looking at the, there we go, looking at using pattern as a surrogate for disturbance and, and understanding the underlying disturbance mechanisms. And to sort of start with, I want to set the context of this talk and begin talking about disturbance in general. And disturbance is a real important process on across landscapes. And primarily it functions to increase the structural and compositional heterogeneity of the landscape. For instance, fire maintains these high elevation meadows in the Cascades. Uh, wind throw creates structural diversity at a large spatial extent, ranging in from a few couple meters to acres and hectares. Uh, flooding, for instance, is an important disturbance process that maintains hardwood component in much of the Western Cascades. Uh, this is an area in the H.J. Andrews that uh, resulted from the 64 flood. And if left untouched, you'd expect conifers to be invading this area. The February 96 flood took care of that, however. This is the same spot today. And of course, we have biotic pathogens such as pine beetle that are creating structural and compositional heterogeneity stand, and of course, among stands or the landscape level. Now, the functional significance of the, these disturbance processes are, um, well, as we can imagine, uh, very important for, say, wildlife species. Uh, it's important for a whole variety of proce ecosystem properties and processes. But being, you know, mostly a wildlife biologist that sort of went astray, I like to always come back to, to critters and understanding the, the important effects of disturbance on the ecosystem. And real quick, this is a little summary bar chart I, um, that I put together uh, reading uh, that came out of Kevin McGargles and Bill McCombs' little study to the BLM in 1993. And this is uh, the Habitat Associations for vertebrate species in Western Oregon. And real quick, the red here indicates positive association with early serial stages. The blue means it's associated, the species tends to be associated with late serial stage. Again, real quick, this is to show 
that there's been some species have uh, adapted, have evolved in early cereal habitat, and some have evolved in late cereal habitat, meaning you need both on the landscape to maintain the indigenous population of, of um, vertebrate species. And I'm sure you can say the same about many different ecosystem processes and properties. Well, this whole natural disturbance and the historic range of variability of natural disturbance is sort of the underlying uh, underpinning to ecosystem management and sustainability issues today. Um, bottom line here is if we can manage uh, or design our land use management schemes that fit within the frequency, severity, and size of natural disturbance, then we'll probably produce a much healthier ecosystem over the long term. And a working concept of this, what we call HRV, Historic Range of Variability of Natural Disturbance, a working concept, uh, a, a, a concept in practice is the Augusta Creek Watershed Analysis uh, Management um, System, I believe, or I should say. Um, this was, uh, this is about 7.6 thousand hectare watershed. Uh, it's in the South Central Cascades. Uh, this is an area where they went out and they did a whole lot of looking at star, uh, scarred stumps to come up with the fire regime history. And they went back 400 years and looking at the fire regime. And based on what they found in their interpretation, they came up with different zones, uh, areas with um, low fires, but when they did have fires, it was very hot areas with lots of fires and low severity. And they used this as a template upon which to base uh, timber harvest schedules for the next two to four hundred years. And so, yeah, it's pretty long term. So this is how we're using this as HRV concept um, in our land use management. And I'm sure, hopefully, or maybe I'm not telling you something you already, you don't already know, but it, uh, I thought I'd give a nice little context or set the context for uh, today's talk by just doing that really quick review. Now, if we want to look at historic range of variability um, other in other places and other types of ecosystems, looking at other uh, disturbance forces, um, we can't all go out and spend three or four years like we've done in Augusta Creek uh, doing a really detailed study. Um, let's say we want to, especially in the future, as I don't want to downplay field work, but basically I think we're going to do less and less field work over much larger areas uh, as we go into the future. One of the reasons is the expense, and another reason is the increase in GIS or remote sensing technology. Uh, let's face it, um, I mean, I like going into the field just as much as anyone else, but you can get a lot of information from satellites and satellite imagery and all sorts of other type of remotely sensed imagery. And so I think the data models, which is essentially like a veg map, um, they're increasingly important in ecological studies. Uh, again, increase in technology, increase in, well, gee whiz, how many people in this room 10 years ago didn't know, didn't know how to use a computer? And I'm sure we all use computers today. Well, 10 years from now, we'll all have our own little GIS sitting in our forest service truck or our own personal little truck as we're driving through the woods. Um, so the technology is, is increasing to the point where we are foolish if we don't use it. Okay, so that's sort of my pitch for high-tech field ecology. Um, with this increase um, in the GIS, the remote sensing technology, um, to look at disturbance processes across the landscape. We're going to rely on using pattern as an indicator of process. And an example of this is this one meter ADAR resolution um, um, image of the H.J. Andrews. And if you look at this, and you look at this, like this red area here, which happens to be deciduous, uh, the green and the yellow are hardwoods. This is open. This is deciduous, the red. If you were to look at that, I mean, it's, it's a nice little picture, and you can see a whole lot of the area there, and fairly convenient to produce this. Uh, if you look at that red zone, however, 
We know it's hardwoods. I mean, what's the first thing that comes to mind with respect to the processes that created that particular pattern of that patch? As you can see, it's sort of <coughs> linear in shape, probably some riparian zone. So you probably have some type of riparian zone disturbance occurring that's creating that particular pattern. Now, this is sort of a prime example of using more or less easily accessible remotely sensed imagery to look at patterns to from which you come up with some idea of the processes involved. It's a very simple example. Um, more complex issues say you want to look at the um, patterns created by fire, um, fire or bugs or whatever. So um, I'm going to sort of put my foot in my mouth. And I said that the remote sensing is real important. Um, it's powerful. It enables us to look at pattern deduced process real quick. However, we're assuming that pattern is, in fact, related to process. So if you have a process, does it create a mutually exclusive pattern? That is the question. Now, it probably seems pretty obvious uh, that that's a real important question. And I would also say that there's probably a whole lot of times when people don't think about that question. They just pretty much are interested in the pretty pictures. They are interested in looking at the patterns and, and coming up with uh, a deduction without really thinking any more about it. And so I, uh, a question that a colleague of mine and I, uh, Gay Bradshaw is her name, we wanted to take a look at this pattern process interaction. We sort of wanted to double check to make sure that processes don't, in fact, create mutually exclusive patterns. And uh, we're also interested in, you know, our ability to statistically document the pattern as it related to a particular process. And we wanted to play some games also. We wanted to switch the ordering of the processes to see if, you know, <laughs> processes that are related, if they produce patterns, if you put one before the other basically just play a few games to look at this particular question of pattern process duality. So we put together a spatial landscape simulation system. It's, it's a very simple thing. Um, and we wanted to look at the relationship between the ecological and statistical significance of landscape pattern and process. And I will, this is pretty much the basis of the talk today. Um, it's a very simple system and I'll mention right now that this is a theoretical assessment of this question and we will get into more of, of the practical aspects of this concept uh, as uh, in the closing remarks. Um, as I mentioned, we were interested in, in simplifying a fairly complex problem into just um, <coughs> some very manageable questions. And one of those manageable questions, or one part of the questions, was looking at the order in which the disturbance occurred in the landscape. We're looking for that. Does a, does a uh, disturbance give you a mutually exclusive pattern on the landscape? And that was a really the primary question that we were wanted to address here. And to do that, we would just change the temporal order of our, our, of our two disturbance processes. Uh, what are those two disturbance processes that we looked at? in this simulation experiment. Well, the first one's my favorite, and that's wildfire. And the second one was bark beetle, the Douglas fir bark beetle infestation. Uh, these two are related through their associations with coarse woody debris, yet yeah, but they're not totally interdependent. So it gave us sort of a nice um, uh, experimental set of, of processes to examine in the study. Um, I don't want to get too bogged down with, this, with describing the spatial simulation system, but I think it is important that you know how, uh, what the components were really all about. Now, um, the vegetative dynamics model, well, actually, let me back up. This spatial simulation system was comprised of the spatial uh, veg dynamics model, a uh, fire mo model, and a bark beetle model. The veg dynamics model, um, simply put, was a simplified variant of a s individual based process based stand model that I work on. It's called Zelig. 
which is actually named after Woody Allen character. I won't get into that any further. Uh, but with this model, we were able to simulate the stand structure, including snags and logs. That's a log. We were able to simulate the within stand conditions of 100 by 100.1 hectare cells, which is what that upper landscape is to represent. So it's a stochastic model, which means every single cell of that landscape can have a different uh, species and size class distribution, a different amount of logs and snags. So it sort of more or less emulates the real world. Uh, cell size, as I mentioned, was 0.1 hectares. Um, what is that? 30 by 30 meters, roughly. 31. Um, there's a couple of things that we did with this landscape. Um, we simulated a 200-year-old landscape starting from bare ground. So that was our initial condition, so 200-year-old old-growthy landscape. <coughs> we uh, evaluated the amount of log mass in each of the cells of our landscape, so we came up with mean amount of log mass. And for reasons I won't go into, we used that as a scaling factor in simulating the disturbances, the wildfire and bark beetle. And that's sort of a modeling technique. And I'll just leave it go at that. If you have any really uh, detailed questions about that methodology, I'll be happy to address them later. So that's our veg model. Our wildfire model, again, it was quite simple. It's a spatial variant of the BEHAVE system, which uh, comes from a variant that I developed during my dissertation work. What does it do? Number one, it spreads from cell to cell as a function of the amount of coarse woody debris, or logs. Um, you randomly select a location in the landscape. The fire starts there, tends to blow, given the maximum direction of the rate of spread, which is ran randomly selected. So you basically just flop a fire down there, and tend to form an elliptical shape. Uh, as a function of the amount of log mass. So there's a nice little interaction between the wildfire and the log mass. Um, overstory mortality is conditioned by the amount of log mass in a cell, for instance. The more log mass, the higher the intensity, the more the overstory trees are killed. And we kill the young ones, the small ones first, the taller ones last. And that's a function of the amount of coarse woody debris on this in a cell. So that's how we did the wildfire, very simple. For the bark beetle spread, the beetle would infest a cell if it, the cell uh, exceeded a certain log mass criteria, which again was part of that scaling factor I mentioned, as, uh, which I won't go into any further. And also you had to have a Douglas fir stem greater than 60 centimeters. So we set up the interaction uh, between the amount of coarse wooded debris and the tendency for bark beetles to spread from that to live um, large dug firs and spread across the landscape as a function of the continuity of the log mass in the large dug firs. So we, I mean, we did use a little biology here. It wasn't just totally hokey pokey, um, but it is very far from being a very detailed biological model of the spread of bark beetle. But that's sort of the art of modeling, is to keep it as simple as possible, yet as useful as possible. The other uh, part I'd like to mention about the beetle infestation is um, we sort of imposed this thing that which we call drought. And that conditioned the ability of the beetle to spread across the landscape. And all that really did was, uh, with the under the no drought situation, the beetle would spread, uh, the threshold uh, was higher for the beetle to infest a particular cell, that threshold being the amount of log mass. Under what we call the severe drought, the log mass was less, um, so a bug could infest the cell that had less log mass under the severe drought condition. And again, it was based on our simulated mean log mass of our initial landscape. Sort of, again, a little modeling technique. So with that, that's our system. It was fairly simple. It was fairly simple. And um, we designed this nice little simple experiment in which we had two different levels of fire in beetle 
initiation. And this, uh, these levels corresponded to like a single wildfire burning 10% of the landscape, uh, single multiple wildfires, three, burning each burning 30% of the landscape. Beetle attack would low would be the number of initiations, meaning you would randomly select an area where beetle infestation would begin, and it would move across the landscape as a function of all the log mass criteria and that I mentioned. And you would have one initiation or five initiations. So you had multiple numbers of initiations of each of these disturbances. On top of that, so that's actually a total of four. One, two, three, four different experiments. On top of that, we had two levels of drought, which really affected the ability of the beetle to spread across the landscape. It either increased or lowered the threshold values. So bottom line is we end up with eight different experiments. Now again, as I mentioned, we're interested in looking at the order. So you would have fire would occur first, then you would have a beetle outbreak. So that would be the first part of a paired sim simulation. You'd then have beetle outbreak followed by fire. Given that the initial locations of each of these disturbances would be would remain constant in this pairwise set of simulations. So we control the spatial aspects for a pairwise uh, set of simulations in which we were changing the um, temporal order of the disturbance. And again, this was a primary thing we wanted to look at. C does one of these, um, does the particular order of the disturbance actually uh, result in a unique pattern on the landscape, a unique pattern that we can detect statistically using some uh, various landscape metrics. So that was a primary um, objective of this particular assessment. Now to further complicate things, we had five replications of each uh, paired set of simulations. So I forget what, I've lost track. I think that's what, 16 times 5? I think that we had 16 times 5 simulations. So the number doesn't matter. The important thing to remember, even if you don't remember the fire low high, beetle low high, drought low high, is we have a big disturbance that is occurring either once or multiple times. We have a disturbance that tends to propagate in a linear fashion. And that occurs under really um, non-severe conditions and the other end of the gradient is very severe conditions, meaning the bugs will, doesn't take much for the bugs to propagate across the landscape. So again, I want to emphasize that the property of these disturbances is what we're emphasizing. We're not trying to say that we are truly simulating wildfire and bark beetles. Okay. For the detection of the pattern, we used a couple very simple metrics. One, uh, two of which were spatial in nature, and uh, the one we used was nearest neighbor distance, and I'll explain that in the next slide a little better. And the other metric was total edge, which is simply the amount of circumference of a patch. Now, those are fairly easy metrics that you can get from like the Fragstats software package, which if you haven't heard of, ask me a question about it later. I'll tell you more about that one. We also, through our remote sensing, we, we being people like Warren Cohen at OSU with the Forest Service, uh, has developed the ability to actually come up with estimates of basal area from remote sensing. Uh, so you could total up the amount of basal area over the landscape. Well, that's a non-spatial metric, even though it's a landscape level. So we were interested in looking at the ability of spatial and non-spatial st statistics to differentiate between ecologically <coughs> different processes, more specifically between the patterning of the process, I mean the temporal ordering of the, of the disturbance processes. So these were our metrics, nearest neighbor, total edge, and total mean basal area. Okay. This is our simulated landscape. Uh, the blue 
Now you keep in mind that these, this is um, the pixel size here is 0.1 hectares. So the blue represents greater than five square meters, or you put it in a per hectare basis, 50 square meters per hectare, meaning it's old growth. The red represents one to five square meters, and the yellow represents less than one square meter. Now this is the initial landscape with a low intensity wildfire. And that's what this mess with this 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 collection of color represents. So a fire was randomly selected to occur here. Since it's at an edge, it does some funny things. It just sits there and burns and burns and burns until 10% of the area is consumed. So uh, the yellow is where the fire burned real hot because the log mass uh, was great. And again, all that was simulated from um, bare ground. So there's an underlying heterogeneity of basal area and log mass and snags, which you can't really see just using these three simple colors. Uh, so that's the yellow. The red, of course, means the, um, well, the fire was hot, but it wasn't real hot. So it was an intermediate severity of, of fire. Again, as a function of the amount of coarse woody debris or log mass. Now, I keep talking about all these patch metrics. What we did was we base our patch metrics on the three colors that you see here, the three patch types. Uh, and the patch types then are, are a function of the am amount of underlying basal area. And forming a patch, a patch is a set of uh, adjacent or diagonal uh, cells of the same type. So we would simulate this condition and then go through and form our patches and then perform our spatial, um, use our spatial metrics to describe the pattern of this. Uh, if you take a look at the patch of this red, for instance, you'll see that it's a very convoluted patch. Um, but it is fairly extensive. Um, and we have various so software programs that performs all this patch assessment for us. So it's, it's really easier than it looks. So this is what a single wildfire on the landscape looks like. This is what a bark beetle outbreak looks like, known as a sort of spaghetti-like running from left to right. Uh, very different type of disturbance. Now of course, I, and I do want to emphasize that this is all simulated. I mean, it's obvious to me it's simulated. Halfway through some of these talks, I always get people that raise their hands and say, that doesn't look like a real pattern. I've never seen that. Well, it's because it's simulated. <coughs> this is a beetle infestation with wildfire overlaid on top of it. Now again, the position of the wildfire and the beetle outbreak are the same as what I showed you previously. Now we're just putting the disturbances down together. Now if you recall, there's this prominent feature of the outbreak of the bark beetle. And you see that it extends up into where the wildfire occurred. Uh, let me back that up. Up here where that uh, extends upward, the wildfire came through. And that particular area burned hotter because there was more log mass on the ground. Log mass originated from the beetles. So thus that area burned harder. What you see is, this is just the wildfire. You see that there's quite a bit of a mosaic of patch types. Well, that mosaic is retained in this wildfire outside of where the beetle occurred first. This is the opposite ordering. This is where the wildfire occurred first, and then the beetle occurred. Interesting point. The wildfire occurred first. Uh, there was more log mass on the ground. The beetle came across infected this area, it not only further reduced the amount of basal area going from red to the yellow, but it also, the beetle, because it was a, we're using a propagation or contagion model, which more or less is how the beetles do spread, uh, the beetle was able to spread out even further than before. This is just the beetle alone. You can see the pattern here, or this edge. 
And when the wildfire is down first and the beetle comes along, you can see that it, in fact, extends out even further. So it's, it's doing something that this particular order not only affects the intensity of the processes within a cell, but also is affecting the, the distribution of the processes across the, um, across the landscape. Uh, this is just another example of the low severity. The, the example I just showed you was the low severity class where you had one event of the fire, one event of the beetle. You were under no drought condition, meaning the propagation threshold were set so that it was hard for a beetle to propagate across the landscape. This is uh, an example of the same condition. This is actually another one of our replicates. But what this shows is the effect of the temporal ordering on the connectivity of the landscape. And I'll backtrack. This is a beetle. It happened first. Wildfire came along. You can see where there tends to overlap, tends to be a little hotter. Hotter meaning uh, more of the basal area is removed and the resulting pixel color is yellow. So this is when you have a wildfire and then the beetle. So you have predisposed this area to propagation by this other disturbance process, i.e. the beetle. It comes along, hits that, and in fact is able to move through and pick up on the other side and traverse across the, the other side of the landscape. Um, this is an example under the same set of conditions, but this is another replicate. This indicates or is attempts to show that in some situations, it really doesn't matter what the temporal ordering is because the processes simply don't overlap. Notice the difference between these two slides. There is none. The temporal ordering has changed, but they just physically they don't overlap, so it just doesn't matter. Again, it's sort of an obvious and intuitive um, uh, result. Um, but all these past three sets of slides were to demonstrate that you can come up with a variety of combinations given everything else the same. Everything else meaning the disturbance frequency intensity and the disturbance types. Yet the resulting landscape pattern can be very different. Uh, this is just a couple examples showing the um, um, what happens when you increase the frequency of bark beetle uh, infestation. This is a single wildfire with five infestations of bark beetle. And again, this is bark beetle, then fire, wildfire, then bark beetle. The difference, uh, again, is a homogenization effect of the wildfire patch. And if you look up here in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see when uh, the wildfire occurs first, the, the bark beetle is able to extend the amount of area that it affects because it's traveling through that patch that the wildfire burned. And these are the sort of the bizarre pictures. The <laughs> this is uh, ex uh, the most intensive uh, combination of disturbances we looked at. This is where you have a lot of fire, a lot of bark beetle initiation, and under what we were calling the severe drought, meaning there's least amount of resistance to the, um, to the propagation of the bark beetle disturbance. So as you can see, the whole landscape pretty much gets, is wiped clean and rearranged. A very interesting pattern. Again, this is just um, one of the replicates. So what does this show us? Uh, what it shows us is, number one, ecologically similar disturbance, meaning the same type, same intensity, frequency, same ordering, can give us some visually very different landscapes. This is an example. Everything is held constant here except for spatial location in these two slides. And as you can see, they look very different. Second set of conclusions or results, um, because they were a little complex, I put them on an overhead so I didn't have to go flipping through the slides.
Okay, well. Oh, wow, cool. It helps when you focus things. I'm sorry? Say what? Okay. Oh, you mean like put it on the screen? It's a very demanding group. <laughs> okay, so what do we have here? Uh, first conclusion result is that you're going to have the same pro ecological processes happening. Uh, you end up with something that looks different in the landscape. Sort of the second general conclusion is, if you notice, this is total basal area. This is total edge. Um, every time the fire, uh, you probably can't read that, but this, the stripe bars um, is when fire occurs first. The open bars is when uh, bark beetle occurs first. You basically, when the, the fire occurs first, if you recall, um, the area where the two disturbances would overlap would be homogenized. You'd have this great big yellow ball. Okay, so what you're doing is you're increasing uh, the amount of Course woody debris, you're predisposing the landscape such that the bark beetle disturbance is able to propagate more so. And in doing so, it reduces the amount of basal area in the landscape. It also creates a big ball, which has less total edge than many small balls. And you're also increasing the distance between patches of similar type. So instead of having a whole bunch of little patches going right across an area, you have a few patches off to the side and this great big ball of a different type sitting in the middle. And what that effectively does is increase the distance between nearest neighbors. Nearest neighbors being patches of similar type. So that's just a real general effect that we've noticed. And it's consistent regardless of the, the frequency of fires, single fires, multiple fires. Um, if you look at the statistical significance of our results, which are based on the five replications. Um, you notice that under the single fire, and the, the fire here in this particular, in our simulation, seemed to be a very dominant, a very dominating disturbance. Under multiple occurrences of this dominating disturbance, um, our metrics could significantly distinguish between the temporal ordering of the disturbance that is the bark beetle and the wildfire disturbances. Regardless of the number of initiations of the bark beetle, uh, if you can't see it, uh, the bottom parts of these graphs are the five initiations of bark beetle. And this side of this graph is the severe drought, corresponds to severe drought. So you have multiple or single initiations of the bark beetle. You're constraining or encouraging or increasing propagation of the linear disturbance. And all of these cases under the multiple dominating disturbance, the temporal ordering is distinguished based on our very simple pattern assessment. Under the lowest severe conditions, which is represented by this column, you can see with only with one exception that our pattern metrics cannot distinguish between the temporal ordering of the disturbances. So that's when the disturbances are occurring, uh, let's say, they're mild disturbances, the least severe of all. You can't seem to distinguish betwe among or between the temporal ordering of these disturbances. Uh, when you have multiple events of this dominating force, you have uh, Pattern metrics are able to distinguish between the temporal ordering only when the other disturbance, i.e. bark beetle, uh, the propagation of the bark beetle is in fact constrained. When you have um, unconstrained or um, lower threshold for propagation inertia, um, you have, the, our metrics are able sometimes to tell us something about the temporal ordering but not all the metrics. For instance, our basal area me metric cannot distinguish between temporal ordering in that latter situation. So what we actually, this is low intensity, this is most severe intensity, and what we seem to have is somewhere in between 
these extremes. Our, our pattern metrics can tell us something about the temporal ordering of the disturbances. And what that pretty much says is there are some thresholds within which, well, outside of which, we can't tell the difference between the, uh, what happened on the landscape, what process occurred, and when it occurred, and what ordering it occurred in relative to another disturbance. Within a certain window, we, our pattern metrics, in fact, seem to indicate that we can say something about the underlying processes. So that's sort of the long-winded uh, result of our very simple little simulation study. The short-winded, uh, or I should say the short answer to this, oops. The short answer to this, can we distinguish ecological significance? Uh, is statistical significance and ecological significance equal? Sort of the pessimistic answer is no. It doesn't always work. Uh, there are some instances where it does, some places where it doesn't. And to be quite honest, I mean, you, you, you I've explained our simulation, I think, for, well, hopefully well enough for you to, to be able to grasp it. I think you can understand or appreciate its simplicity, its um, non-realism, but its usefulness. And so we pretty much have just taken a sort of a quick and dirty look at a very complex problem, and we've simplified it. And we've come up with a conclusion that more or less is a little more than a hypothesis. Our hy hypothesis uh, pretty much says that there are conditions and situations in which very simple pattern metrics can tell us something about underlying disturbances, but not always. So not always, well, under what conditions can you and can't you use simple pattern metrics to look at the disturbances? And that's pretty interesting because I have no answer. I don't know. And that's pretty much what this bottom conclusion suggests or indicates, is that we need to know. We need to go out and figure that stuff out. Um, I will return to how we do that. I only have two more points I'd like to make regarding this type of pattern process evaluation. Now, imagine, if you will, that this is the type of remotely sense information that you pick up from your local corner GIS store. And you are looking at some particular process. Well, this happens to be 25 meter resolution. Um, you may recognize this slide. I had a slide of this earlier, only different res. This was produced by Earl Eckley and Warren Cohen at OSU. Um, if you were to pick up this information and to look at the pattern and use this pattern assessment to come up with some idea of the disturbance processes, um, at this particular resolution, you, for instance, may come up to, you may, I don't know what you'd conclude. You'd look at this, let's say, let's concentrate on that patch. You may conclude that that's just an own growth patch and there hasn't been any disturbance there at all. There's no disturbance happening there. Um, if you were to look at a 15 meter, meter resolution of this site, you in fact would see that, well, it's not quite a big patch of old growth. There's some hardwoods, and again, uh, or, or young conifer, which is what the yellow represents. So this may give you a slightly different answer to your pattern assessment and the resulting um, deduction regarding the type of disturbance that has or possibly <coughs> will occur in that particular spot. Now, you take that down to five meter resolution. And this is all ADAR data, I might add. Five meter resolution, and you know, you look at that and you go, well, gee whiz, that's, that's not a really old growth stand. That's, that's sort of broken up. So your pattern metrics would give you a different answer and you may end up with a different conclusion using this resolution of information. Now if we take it down to, to one meter, and you take a look at that spot again, you see in fact <laughs> that there tends to be a whole lot of young conifer in this area. And it's just sort of a mishmash. And again, uh, the type of pattern metrics that you would uh, 
that would uh, you would generate for that image is very different from what you would get with that image. Now these are the identical images. In fact, the real <laughs> the real data uh, is the one meter, and the 25 meter is just uh, using an aggregate algorithm. But the bottom line here is the resolution at which you go out and look at your uh, particular process, or the at which you collect your remotely sensed imagery. <coughs> um, it's real important to make sure that you're collecting information at the correct resolution, correct being the resolution that matches the pattern and the processes that you're really interested in, especially the, the disturbance process that you're really interested in looking in. And the intent of showing these four slides is to show you potentially that different answer you would get as a function of the resolution of the information you were looking at. The second, uh, the screen size, the second sort of take home here, or the second, or the last point I'd like to make, is um, I talked about these pattern metrics, and I went over that real quick, and said nearest neighbor, and total edge, and total base of area. Um, I won't go into the why we use those metrics. The one thing I want to point out is there are quite a few patch and landscape metrics out there on the, again, you can pick up at your corner patch metric store, so to speak. There's quite a few. Um, you have, uh, you can sort of break them down into three groups, and the, they, those groups are metrics related to shape, size, and extent, and connectivity. Um, what I've just shown here is just really a handful of metrics. Um, the problem is you really have to be careful in choosing the metrics you use to do your assessment. And the reason for that, well, which I will show by example, um, these are two simulated landscapes at the same point in time. This was simulated using an aggregated harvest strategy, and that was simulated using a dispersed harvest strategy. And you can take a look here, well, real quick. The red, the yellows, the aquas are hardwoods, and the greens are conifers. Simple. And just looking at the, the um, aqua and the reds, you can really see it. it. There's quite a difference in the patterning. So if we were to use just these six landscape metrics, um, you can see that some of the metrics are, in fact, quite different, and some, in fact, are, are pretty much the same. Um, and the aggregated, uh, the metrics associated with that image on the left-hand side of the aggregated harvest uh, image is in red, and the other one's in the yellow here. And you can see that like, the number of patches per unit area and the inside area and the amount of s circumference is very different. Uh, difference between patches of, same of the same, similar type, aren't quite that different. And then you end up with these things, like Shannon's, Shannon's Diversity Index, Mean pa Patch, Fractal Dimension. Um, <laughs> Tim and I were talking about fractals before the talk. You know, I have yet to figure out what a fractal, well, I know what a fractal dimension is. I haven't quite figured out why we'd want to use them. Uh, you will see it in the landscapey literature. And again, take a look at these two landscapes. Now, do they look different to you? They do to me. Well, based on Shannon's diversity index, the mean patch, fractal dimension, they're not different. So uh, here, the take home message here is um, be careful in using and choosing your metrics for any type of landscape assessment. In fact, it's really cool to do what I've done here. I've been meaning to do this with a whole lot of metrics is generate a couple of really different landscapes and then start looking at how the metrics react to those landscapes. That's the only way you really get a good feel for, it's the only way I think you can really believe or trust in your pattern metrics, for instance. So I am sure this is, you're all so terribly fascinated by this scintillating display of simulation and colors and, and all that sort of super groovy, neat stuff. I'm also sure you're sitting there saying, what the heck does this have to do with my stuff? Because I sure, as if I were sitting <laughs> in your shoes, I sure would be saying that too. In fact, I sometimes ask myself that. 
Um, well, let's say you want to go out and you want to take a look at where disturbance doesn't happen. And the old ponderosa pine being, um, uh, I'm sorry, fire suppression ponderosa pine systems and the fur coming in underneath. Um, you may want to go out and take a look at where fire suppression has resulted in these types of stands. You may want to go out and take a look at where some prescribed fires or natural prescribed fires have gone through your system. You want to look at the frequency, intensity. You want to look at the dis underlying disturbance processes. Um, like he s which uh, my intent here today wasn't to give you the answers, what, but to give you some potential insights into how you would go about using some of the remote sensing GIS technologies to look to use um, in using pattern as a surrogate for disturbance processes. And my wife tells me people only remember five points from the talk. I'm going to be a nice guy. I only give you four points you have to remember from my talk. Uh, the first one is, <laughs> hmm. The second one <laughs> is, I'll be done. The first one, what is the first one? Um, boy, I had these memorized. Um, I really uh, have to apologize. I do forget it. Well, let's go to the second one. Maybe the first one will come back to me. <sighs> the second point is related to the first one, so I can't remember that one either. <laughs> Son of a bitch. Well, three and four are pretty easy. The third one has to do with the scaling issue. Choose a scale that your process represents. Oh, that's it. Phew. Wow. Um, the first, really, the, the big take home is um, under some conditions, uh, you can use this pattern stuff, pattern metrics, to really come up with the, uh, some estimate of the type of disturbance or ordering of disturbances that are going on out in this landscape. You know, what we need to do is like uh, we do with building habitat models or doing re classification of remotely sensed imagery. You always have a test data set and you develop your models based on the test data set. If and even with that model, you go out and you test it against some data that were not used to generate that model. Um, if you want to go out and you want to look at these fine scale processes that are occurring here in the west side, for instance, um, go out and collect some information on the ground, collect some information from the sky, so to speak, i.e. Uh, overlay it on top of your remotely sensed imagery. Do an assessment of looking for correlates between your remotely sensed imagery and what you see in the ground. And you know, see how well you can fit the disturbance processes with particular pattern. Um, I mean, that's sort of easier said than done because, you know, you have a whole lot of different things happening out there in the real world. I mean, that's why we did a simulation study because we didn't have t 20 years and millions of dollars to <laughs> do extensive field studies. So maybe you go out and you look at a couple of the real important disturbance processes that you're interested in, the big ones that are really affecting the system that you're working in, and basically develop your correlates with your pattern. Um, using empirical data, and then test it. Meaning, go someplace else, try it out, see if it works. And if it does, then maybe you have a halfway decent management tool that you can use to uh, do a very broad scale assessment of disturbance processes. That's really point number one. How could I have forgotten that one? I don't know. Um, but I still forget the second point. So I'll be darned if I'll have to, I can't give you that one. Third point has to do with the scale. Uh, and going out and doing your assessment out in the woods um, and doing your assessment using remotely sensed imagery. You got to use the information at a resolution that is really, that means the most to the process that you're looking at, that reflects, that corresponds to the level at which um, your, your disturbance process is, is affecting the ecosystem. And the fourth point is be careful in choosing your landscape metrics and the patch metrics that you use to describe the pattern on the ground. Um, as again, as I hopefully I've showed you here, um, some of the metrics make some sense, seems to correspond to what you would think just by looking at two very different images. And there are some times where some of those metrics 
you know, are pretty much the same for very different visually uh, different images or landscapes. Uh, if I happen to think of the second point, I'll let you know. Give me your email address and I can email you. Hey, it was a really good one, but I'll be darned if I can remember it. Well, so what's this, what should the second point be? Any suggestions? What's the take home? Other than the, the three and the missing second one, or fourth one, point that I mentioned. Well, I have a question sure. as to whether or not this uh, uh, satellite imagery is, can really be used uh, on the east side, given the fact that our, uh, our stands are uh, you know, at scales that are require much higher resolution. Mm -hmm. And we have so many different disturbance agents that are all interacting. You just showed two, and we've got mm -hmm. half a dozen that are all operating there at different scales and at different mm -hmm. sequences. I really wonder whether or not this technology is going to be all that useful for the bit like district. Yeah. Um, well, it, I, I th that's a really good question. I really don't know the answer. Um, it, it really depends on the question you're asking. And this is something, I mean, it's totally unrelated to this pattern process stuff. It's, it's just reality, and that's, um, you sort of, we always make compromises in the l resolution at which we look at something, whether it's out there measuring trees or s doing simulation modeling or using remote sensing to look at pattern. And um, the, really, you're, to answer your question, you'd have to understand the objective. I mean, a particular objective has to be identified and described. In some cases, the remote sensing probably would do a terrible job. Because you're right, it's, it's tough getting down to individual species. Um, the remote sensing image, the 1 meter, 15, 5, 15, 25 meter ADAR image, there's only four class types. There's nothing there about tree species, individual species. And that's one meter resolution. And we have quite an extensive remote sensing shop. And they find it very, very tough to identify individual species in a very simple system relative to out so here. Even, so you tried that. You tried to use the, sp like the spectral you know, frequencies and all stuff no. to identify species? No. I've been pushing for it. Um, it isn't, um, it isn't all that easy, and our remote sensing person is sort of resistant to, to, um, to do that kind of research. Because on, on the west side, if you're a structural stage, <coughs> you just clear cut. That's what they do over there. It's just a mosaic of different mm -hmm. clear cuts, right? So as trees grow, they get bigger. If you can identify the, the structural size classes, mm -hmm. you say maybe four of them, yeah. then you can do this kind of stuff. Yeah. Over here, we don't clear cut that much. Mm -hmm. There's some of it, but a lot of it's selective cutting. So what does that do to the spectral frequency well, you see from space? Th you're, yeah, you're doing selective cutting. What's your spacing like? What's your spacing between your big big canopy trees? It's real variable. Mm -hmm. I, mean it, I mean, we have a lot of foresters here. And okay. People who've done that work. And some people do these uh, real you know, seed tree kind of things. Uh -huh. Basically, take an overstock stand and thin it to the point where it begins mm -hmm. to has a little bit of growing room. Yeah. But the point is that, that um, well, if if let me let me real quick before you move on here, um, my understanding is that uh, you're doing this selective cutting in uh, ponderosa pine systems, where the trees are much more spaced out than in the, say an old growth deck fir system. And in, in fact, there may be even a greater chance, depending on the spacing, but there may be even a greater chance of seeing the effects of selective cutting upon the rest of pine system because they're more open. The trees are more widely sp spaced. And so you have a satellite coming along. It's you you want to make a bet? I think I can do it. <laughs> My luck. Well, at least thanks for telling me. I didn't stand there all day and just rip it out. Um, hopefully.
Well, you might have to increase your research budget to get some chalk. <laughs> okay, so my point here, and I'll do it with graphics. You know, this is a Ponderosa Pine system. And let's say this crown here, I mean, the stuff that I was showing was one meter, ADAR, which is pretty intense. I mean, everyone in the brother and sister doesn't have ADAR data sitting around. Um, but we do have like TM, which is at 25 meter. So if you're, um, if the space in between your big canopies are greater than 25 meters or at about 25 meters, you probably have a better chance of picking up the fact that you had some selective cutting, um, especially, of course, at the one meter. Well, or five meters. Actually, that series that I showed you, um, people told me that the five meter resolution is really the best to work with. I mean, the one meter gets just, uh, there's too much stuff. And the five meter is a lot easier to work with. There's less information. And when you start working at resolution less than the canopy widths, you're asking for some potential problems. And Now that was originally working with the 25 meter TM. Well, it sounds like you need to use something, uh, uh, a coarser resolution. Finer. And do you think finer? Mm -hmm. I thought the problem was your, it was so fine that you're yeah, looking. Not big enough, enough to increase the millimeter of I thought you were, you were coming down, you're looking, you saw too much. You saw too much and you're calling this old growth stem a young stem because you're picking up the, the mm -hmm. young stuff. So a coarser resolution would potentially wipe that out. I don't know. Good research project. Okay, so let's, okay, that's, uh, any, anyone else? What's it, okay, yes sir. One thing that appears to me is that these type of uh, modeling systems work if you've got a homogeneous setting. Mm -hmm. And it looks like you're considering basically uniform stands, uh, similar species. Mm -hmm. and <coughs> I would guess similar substrates and things like precipitation levels, all pretty similar. Out here in the in Northeast Oregon, we get uh, very complex settings mm -hmm. where you might have completely different species on one side of the a north slope than you do on a south slope. Mm -hmm. It seems like you'd have to um, make sure that if you're gonna use this type of process, that you stayed within homogeneous areas and, uh, and apply the technique within those areas. Is there, are there ways of doing that? That uh, you can take a big area and, uh, and apply that, like uh, apply the techniques selectively for oh, areas within mm -hmm. that big area? Okay, by the techniques, you're talking about like the pattern assessment and relating process? Yeah, that type of are modeling that you did. Or the simulation modeling. Well, the, the pattern assessment you did on the simulation. Okay, okay, the pattern assessment. Okay, just wanted to make clear. 
I mean, the simulation was to generate the pattern, and the pattern assessment is something that you could do on any plane. So that's yeah, what you yeah, mean. So. Um, sure. You know, <laughs> GIS is a magic wand. You can do anything. Uh, sure, you can separate your, if you know the underlying environmental conditions, you could separate out an area that uh, had similar substrate or similar conditions and just sort of cookie cut that piece out and just do perform an assessment. In fact, that it's, it's a sensible thing to do because uh, you can imagine a, of, um, an elevational gradient in which fire frequency would change up that gradient. And it would make sense to look at pattern on top and down at the bottom and coming up with an overall f um, assessment of fire frequency. Just so matter, uh, tinkering with the GIS. Just system. cutting out the pieces. Actually, yeah, that's the easy part. The diff more difficult part would be finding the domain of a particular environmental region. Um, I'm sure you can imagine or know what soil series maps are like, their quality, their resolution, um, precip temperature information. Again, the same thing. Mm -hmm. They tend to be very coarse level information, but you could use that to delimit your environmental region of interest. Well, that's what I make maps like that. I just oh. wonder how, if they could be applied. Sure, okay. yeah. Um, the question I have, I, I mean, this is only my second time on the ground. Um, I get over to the east side, it's usually Metolius and Pringle Falls. Uh, so I don't get way east here. I don't get up to the blues that much. Um, I've actually, I've only been through them once, so I got a speeding ticket doing it. I'll be darned if I go back now. Um, the question, what am I leading up to? The question I'm leading up to is, I mean, what's, what's the most significant disturbance process um, of interest to the managers? Now, I understand, I mean, I know about the east side issues. I mean, I've heard about the east side issues. Um, we're possibly way outside the historic range of variability. Um, I guess my question is, what factor, what disturbance process do we need to implement to sort of bring the system back into historic range of variability? Is there just one single, is it just fire? Is that the major problem over here? Um, no, we, love, we love the hell out of things over here too. Uh-huh. And that's pretty, that's a severe disturbance. So how do we, how do we uh, sort of swing the system back to where we think it should be or where we think it used to be? Using log mass is what we used to do. Log mass? I think management's concerned about anything is knowing where these log mass concentrations are and where the highest risk is. I mean, you know, when you deal with rock coal, we know that's a pain. I mean, that's a no-brainer. But, you know, but that's also what happens when it's done, right? So you don't, what I'm hearing is it's, you know. If you ask five people, you'll get 10 different answers. Sure. <coughs> so what's your answer? Uh, my answer is I think, I think fire is uh, a big component, but I think we're going to have problems in trying to figure out how do we reduce fire without some of the massive mm -hmm. conflagrations, also the air quality issues mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. Can I give you an example of a real problem? 
a University of Montana student wrote to me and their uh, class is working on uh, a program uh, on the mountain habitat on the Hell County National Recreation Area. And, they were, and the question for me was, uh, uh, what do you know about these areas? Well, uh, uh, it, in Martin, uh, it almost uh, never gets more than about uh, uh, five meters from uh, uh, a cover. And uh, so here we had uh, the Canal Fire and uh, the uh, Twin Lakes Fire that burned together, separating the uh, High Wallawas, which would be your source habitat, from the habitat on the National Recreation Area. And of course, there's a lot of little uh, spots uh, of uh, green uh, stuff. But how are they ever going to uh, uh, come up with any kind of a, a plan or thought to uh, uh, get the uh, interconnected corridors mm. and uh, uh, things like that so that the habitats on the National Recreation Area are not just sink habitats where you're going to lose the population. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. there yeah. Well, is there is there an interest in looking at the uh, h historic range? I mean, b going back 400 years in time and trying to dig out the figure out the fire record. Why? I mean, it's interesting because of. Right. You can do it, mm -hmm. nobody wants to give up anything. Clean air, that's, that's the hard part. I mean, this as a display might be really useful if you can draw you know, it's a proper conclusion from it. Mm -hmm. We're all going to be on strip list this year, Tina, so if you have personnel to do it. <laughs> <laughs> wow, there's an uplifting <laughs> thought. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. Huh. Wow. This is sort of bleak. <laughs> <laughs> I'm depressed. Well, one gentleman mentioned <laughs> that <Sure>. the uh, <coughs> logging that takes place, and uh, I would simply suggest that if we uh, move some of the logging that's taking place from healthy forest mm -hmm. to unhealthy forest, meaning ones that are overloaded with fuel, we might make quite some gains. That's what we're trying to do, though. And, and we're being stopped at every turn. Can't by who? By lawsuits. I mean, by threats from environmental groups. Um, and the problem and timber is companies who won't bid on And no, also it, economics, right. Yeah. That's yeah. The, big, the big problem is, you know, what someone sees as a healthy forest is not necessarily a healthy forest based on risk. And that's the whole thing. I mean, what's your risk assessment? And if you can couple something like this with a risk assessment, you know, I mean, that's what this is in, in a way, or it is. You know, that, it, but it's really tough because when I look at a stand of trees and I have someone from the public standing next to me, if it's green, it's healthy. Mm -hmm. 
it may be it may be a, a, a pine forest with a dark fir, grand white fir understory. And you know, I'm just going, oh, this is just the way right. I know that right. they're looking at me like oh, you're hmm. yeah. how can you think that way? And it's very tough to convey this. Mm-hmm. cities where the closest they get to nature is Albertsons or Safeway. <laughs> hey, they have a good produce section, <laughs> don't you? Um, even out here? I don't mean to imply that we're out here in the boonies. I know we're not, but. There's a lot of people moving here from, like, you know, Portland. a lot of Californians move here. Really? Because even over here, huh? What's wrong with that? <laughs> people can't understand. appreciate or can't uh, understand the dynamism of these systems over here. Mm -hmm. and, uh, That's what I'm we're, hearing. We're, our tendency is to, is to prevent change. Um, right. and, it, and it's true that the old growth is so limited now that every single patch we have we want to protect. But we know darn well we're not really going to be able to protect them. They're going to change eventually. Well, we really right. set ourselves up for that for the mindset, too, and that's not good. Right, right. <laughs> so maybe what? <laughs> Did you say you think we should smoke him? No, 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 no. Shoot him. <laughs> oh. Well, that's what I thought you meant by smoke him. <laughs> <laughs> wow. In defense of smoke, smoke is still has a strong message to play is that if fires bear down in your house because it's an unwanted fire. Yeah. to go back to Corvallis and report that there's a group of people up here that want to shoot Smokey the Bear. <laughs> <laughs> huh. Now I understand and agree with you, Fallon. Um, I think you got a real good thing mm -hmm. going, and I was keeping very vigorous notes for up halfway, and then it dawned on me it didn't look like it was going to say what I wanted you to say. <laughs> and so, oh, sh oh shucks. <laughs> there's yes, really sir. more happening over on the east side of yeah. the forest that would be adaptable to what you have because mm -hmm. you have such a wide range of resource variations. Mm -hmm. Burn up a lot of, right. of uh, fire, and I thought, wow, I can get you to give us the same program on just the north fork of the John Day. Mm -hmm. And um, it would answer a lot of our questions and then you, you got to the last and you said no it, I don't think it does answer the mm. west side I think you're saying would answer problems that we have on this side. well I think well, let me just reiterate so that I'm clear um, I think the pattern process interactions the being able to detect the processes from pattern through our little simulation study suggests that in some cases you can, in some cases you can't. And that's really the take home, a take home. Maybe that's the second one. That must have been the second one. Good Lord, I can't believe I did that. <laughs> um, yeah, that was the second one. Um, and the other one is that, uh, which I think gets back to the first take home, and that's uh, we sort of need to figure out where you can and where you can't. And this simple, very simple little study simulations that I showed really don't do that. Again, all they've what we've done is make is generated hy hypothesis and added a little bit of fodder to the fire, so to speak, fuel to the fire, um, encouraging us to yeah. basically continue to look for it. 
In fact, to be quite honest, very, very honest, it has been a little while since I've we wrote this study, or did this study, and it, it, I sort of forgot how neat it was until uh, I had the opportunity to come up and talk about it. And the one thing, you know, you know how it is. I mean, you always get busy. You get off something else. It will take you a week. A year later, you're still on it. Um, but in going back over this, I, I sort of realized that there's some really cool opportunities to actually get out in the field and start looking at this. You know, hey, take some of these hypotheses and get out there and start looking for examples. And uh, I was sort of encouraged to, uh, to potentially do that. Have you been much on the shoulder of the Walla Walla East Side study? Because they used an awful lot of what you have there. Mm -hmm. And you'd be really fascinated with what they're doing in the last couple of years. OK. No, I haven't uh, been keeping track. Yeah. OK, thanks. Great. Are there any other like more general questions? I realize it's getting late and people want to go. So Steve will be around. He's made a commitment to be around for a while. So if anybody has wants to okay, talk to him right. later, we get he can answer more questions. Sure. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.